we are sitting in the local public library. And I thought it would be a good time to record here, since this is where I started, not specifically in this library. But over 28 years ago, I had my own school and was an educator. And in my research, I have ran into a ton of topics. So I thought it was appropriate to start here. Mm. Anytime I teach you something, it's because there's validated fact. And we have a lot of information to share with you. We've been recording, but we haven't released a lot of it yet. But we're going live today so that you can kind of catch what's going on. Mm. Whenever I began to teach and educate people about topics, again, I had started my own private school, taught in the private school, and then progressed, and of course I've been pastoring now for 34 years. And for you who watch this and you're questioning whether or not you should be in the ministry, we're going to debunk all of the rhetoric involved in that. Right. I know I had to fight a lot of battles because 34 years ago, for a woman to be in the pulpit just wasn't going to happen. Right. And I couldn't understand the call of God whenever the church as a whole in every denomination across the board was shooting the whole prospect down or the thought yeah. down. You've made mention in the past how that you even had to fight that in your own family, right? I did. When um, when I first came to this church and I told some of my family, not my immediate family because my immediate family didn't say anything about it, but my extended family, when I told them about it and when I brought up the fact that you were a woman, <laughs> It was just the whole red flags came out. All of a sudden, it was like, oh, you shouldn't be in that church because it's not, it's not right for women to preach and all this stuff and like that. I was like, you know what? I felt God there. I felt God, and I know what I'm seeing. I know what I'm feeling and that. And if I'm feeling that way, if I know it's God, it can't be wrong. So regardless of what anybody says, I'm still going to be here, so regardless. Right. And I remember telling you and several others, my children, when I first started, what kind of backlash that I got. The attacks were unmerciful. And I would think, if you're supposed to be a Christian and you're supposed to have the attributes of Jesus Christ, why are you attacking me? Right. All I'm simply doing is sharing the gospel with people. And whenever they said, well, you're not supposed to assert authority. Well, when I looked up the word assert, it means to take authority that has not been given to you. Right. So the men who would come to our church, or even the women, would give me the right to give them direction. There's a vast difference of a woman pastor versus a man pastor. Women, for the most part, if they're good-hearted pastors, they want their flock to develop and right. to grow, and they don't have a problem with you surpassing them. Men want to keep you lorded over, right. telling you you can't do that, you're not as great in God as I am. I never was in competition, and when Julian first came to my church, of course, he was just a young man. I hope that's, <laughs> that's telling off, isn't it? I started the church when I was 33 and a half, and I used to make the parallel. Uh, I started when Jesus ended. You know, at the age of 33 and a half, he's supposed to have been crucified, and I'm just picking up where he left off. I had no idea that the road we were going to travel was going to be so intense. I just knew that I wanted to serve God with all of my heart. I know that you out there, you love God, and you want to be obedient to Him. You want to honor Him. And so when these things come up, you're kind of left with uncertainty. And I always felt like you should know the facts. And then from the facts, you weigh out the judgment. You determine. And so we come up with a lot of things. And the biggest, hottest topic right now is what, Julian? Jesus. Is Christmas pagan or Christian? Is Christmas pagan or Christian? And I hope to see that... I'm sorry, I'm getting messages across. I'm trying to read messages and tell you what I was going to tell you. I'm going to prove to you in this series where you should stand on many topics. You who have Christmas trees up in your churches, you have them up in your houses, I get told all the time, that's not why I've erected that. That's not what this is about. I love God and I serve God. And I'm not here on this broadcast today to debate this. 
In fact, we really want to bring it back to the basics. So understand, I do know the answer to that, as well as many other things. But have you ever wondered why some of this doesn't seem right? I mean, we both were talking about that the other night. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I'm sure that if you read the Bible a couple of times, or even once, I mean, you see that there's questions there, or there's some stuff that you don't understand, and that some of it doesn't make sense. Right. Some of it don't make sense, or some of it you kind of question, like, well, how is this, you know, how is that supposed to be, or how is that? That's, you know, I was like that too. I was like that, and I came, you know, and, and I would just, like I said before, I'm a, I'm a skeptic when it comes to, I don't accept things just because. You have to bring them to me to my level and, you know, explain to me and how, until I get it down in my head, make sure everything's said, and then I can move forward. Before that, I can move forward. I need to see, I need to, I need to find out, you know, for sure. And a lot of stuff, you know, that's why I brought to you when I first came, you know, a couple of years, you know, I kept you know, asking you a lot of questions, you know, that I need to have a second mind. Ask him how many times he came to my office in those few first years. <laughs> I can't even count a lot. I mean, I was <laughs> almost there, daily. Almost daily, yeah. <laughs> like I said, it had to be settled in my mind. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that really want to serve God, that really want your and your questions answered. And But you all been told that don't question the ministry. Oh, yeah. You cannot question the ministry because if you question the ministry, you get ostracized and stuff like that. Or they'll start telling you that you're into false religion and stuff like that. It's not about being a false religion or anything like that. It's just that you have questions and you need to you need to deserve an answer. And that's one thing that I, th I think I told you before that if you hadn't answered my questions when I first came, I would have left. I would have left because, you know, then I mean, I wouldn't get an answer from what, what was in my mind. So why would I be here if you can't give me an answer? And I want to insert here. When he came into the church, he had came for quite a while, and it was God who put him in as my assistant. You see, prior to that, I had had several different men who were my assistants. Uh, I'm just going to give you a breakdown about a couple of them. The first assistant pastor, I thought the world of him. He had a great personality, and he got tested by the fact that his wife had had an affair with one of my Sunday school teachers. And when I, it took me a year to get to the bottom of it. And when I did, I brought him in and they confessed it. Well, I knew that his wife was my secretary and I could not allow that in the church. So I sent them to two different churches. And I thought, well, I'm going to just set her down for the time being and we'll see what happens. Again, I was a young pastor. No knowledge of how to deal with such grave issues. So when I went and saw that there really was no change happening, I went to that assistant pastor, and I brought the woman who his wife was having an affair with and set them in the, in the sanctuary to talk to me. And I said, why don't you go ahead and tell him what's going on? Because I felt like he wasn't listening to me. He didn't believe me. And so she proceeded to say, I'm having an affair with your wife, and it's been going on for over a year. And... I thought at this point he was going to take a stand as a minister because I knew I couldn't allow that. Right. And he said, oh, okay, I'm still going to be with her. And at that point I realized his dedication to God wasn't there. He stayed a few more weeks and then he went to a neighboring UPCI church and they accepted them in just that way. Because you see they had some moolah, had some cash. So they didn't have a problem taking their money in. But they didn't say a word to him about the sexuality. That in some cases, it would be bisexual, some would be a lesbian. It doesn't really matter what you name it. And at that point, I had my first church split. Most of the church was related to them, and they all walked out on me. But I still said, if I start over, I'll start over. I'm not going to keep my eyes on what I lost. I'm going to keep my eyes on him. Sure. And if he is my guide, and he is, then I cannot allow sin in leadership. I've had a very strong stand on that from day one. Time progressed, and we had another man who came in as our assistant pastor. And one night, I got a phone call. The phone call was, Pastor, this man just made a sexual pass at me. It was a young man. And he called me in a sheer panic. And immediately, I was living in the back of the church. Immediately, I took a stand and I said, I'm, I'm not going to tolerate that. 
So not only did I get the men on the phone, but I also threw them out that same night. And to this day, the young man occasionally still contacts us. He doesn't live very close to me. And I said, no, we're not allowing that. You see, your pastors are responsible for oversight of the flock. Right. If they allow sin in the church, God will not move in the church. He will not have full dominion. He will withdraw his spirit very quickly. Every man and woman will come to a time of testing in their life when it comes to ministry. For years, I prayed for my first assistant pastor to come back and thinking that, well, maybe God will deal with him and he'll return. He continued to go to that same church he went to after he left mine. And one day, and I don't remember how long you've been going now, I, I, you're already married to Stacy. Mm -hmm. And so I was in the prayer in the sanctuary, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you've prayed that I would send this man back, but I will not. He said, I sent to you a greater man of integrity, a man that loves me. And I said, well, where is he? I, I wasn't aware that, you know, that was even a possibility. Mm -hmm. I was looking around. Yes, we had quite a few men in our church, but I knew that that was not what I felt. And then he said, he's before you in prayer. And I looked up and turned around and or looked up because I didn't turn around. You were there. And I said to the Lord, Julian, you're calling Julian to be a preacher and to be an assistant of the church? And he said, yes. So I went over and I talked to Julian and I said to him, did God call you to preach? Now tell him what you made this feast before God that you weren't going to tell me. Yeah, he had, he had called me to preach before. That. He, had, he had shown me a vision and everything where, he, where I was in a pulpit and everything, but I didn't want to accept it. And I, you know, I just, to me, that was, to me, in ministry, it's, it's a very, a calling that's, don't take it lightly. Yeah, it just it's too much responsibility. So I, I didn't want it. I was like, no, you know, that's not for me. That's for somebody else. I don't want that. And I had told Stacy about it that you know what happened on it, but we just left at that. that well, you know, don't tell anybody. Just you know, because I, I don't want it. I don't want none of that. And it went part of it. So that's why I left it. And then until you brought it up that that day, it was like if you when you asked me for if you had come to preach, I was like. Yeah, and I just lost it because I knew that was confirmation that something that I didn't want to hear, but it was was true. What he had told me before, what he had shown me, what had, it was true. And when he did that, I remember that day when you said yes, that I anointed you as the assistant pastor that yeah. very moment. Right. I went up and got the anointing oil and I came over and anointed it. You say, well, had he been trained? His heart was that he loved God, and that's all the training he needed. I needed someone sincere and stable that would not weigh in their position. Julian has great conviction. As I've got to know him over the years, we now have been knowing each other, I guess, since you were 24? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a long time, 23, 24, somewhere in there. And we've grown together, and of course his wife is like a daughter to me, and some of you have heard about her. And she is a jewel, the best assistant pastor's wife in the world. She never is a combative individual. She's very uh, open to state different things that she feels are necessary. But she doesn't disregard or disrespect me, and she sure doesn't disrespect you. So the three of us have become intimately woven in our personal lives and in the ministry. And I think it's safe to say at this point that I am involved in seeking God and research. What, what would you say? Very often or not very often? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> All the time. And you're always calling me and something. Look, look what I found this and that. And you're just expounding on it. And like you start telling me about it, it. But it's all the time. Really. I study seven days a week. And even in the midst of my surgery, I had some time I wasn't in my office studying. And it was driving me crazy. And then I said, you know what? I've had the surgery. I'm making progress. Whether I'm in pain or not, I'm going to continue to do what God had called me to do. And that's to show you all what this is about. So in laying this foundation and listening to different people post about Christmas and pagan and non-pagan, I called you in the other day and I said, you know what? 
I think where the problem is, is there's this debate that's going on, and many Christians know that Christmas is pagan. Right. That's not debatable. But because the pastors won't stand up and expound on it and tell you it's idolatry and tell you why it's wrong, they put them up in their houses. They put them up in their churches. And it, it got to where it really disturbs me because I'm thinking about that first commandment, right. how God said not to have any other before him. Mm-hmm. He also says in his word, you cannot put importance on someone other than him and that he will not share his glory with another. That's because when people think about idolatry, at least I, myself, I thought of that before. When you think about idolatry or you hear the word, you automatically assume that it's gods, you know, idols and stuff like that. Not necessarily things or things you're involved with or things that take your time, right? which is an idol too. And if you think about that, we can't just focus on Christmas trees. What about sports? You all get out there in the freezing cold and cheer on these people while they're attacking each other. That's almost like gladiators, isn't it? Even politicians. I mean, you, just, you, I mean, you see all the people out there cheering for them, you know, applauding them and assaulting them and all that. Politicians. Yeah, it's it's really sad because when we put God first, sports is not how we survive. We don't care about what the score is. I remember seeing people run out of church on Sunday when I used to go to church on Sunday and visiting other churches. And they'd get out the door as quick as they could to go see what the score was. In baseball, and it didn't matter what the sport was. Well, that's not the only thing that we have lifted and elevated as an idol. Mm-hmm. What about our jobs? The importance of our jobs where we're so proud to be who we are in this workforce. Career. Career. Career, because sometimes the, a career, when you say to your mind, you want to have a career, it takes precedence over everything. Yes, you just, you just your life, You're living your life towards that goal. You want to achieve that goal, and you forgot about everything else. You know. And all that really goes down to money. Mm-hmm. You want the status. You want the money. You want to be recognized by your family and friends that you're a success. You know what? I don't care if I'm dirt poor, as I used to say, don't have a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. I don't care as long as I have God in my life. So we've put idols in our life, and yet we don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. You know, some will say, I know the book of Jeremiah chapter 10 tells us not to erect a Christmas tree in our house. But you're missing the whole thing. If that was not an idol to you, why can't you take it down? Why do you put snowmen up and all these decor of Santa and his little elves, knowing elves are little demons? Why are we doing that? Why are we debating it? Shouldn't we not want to offend God regardless of what we do? Shouldn't we want to honor him and put him in top, and I don't mean as an angel on the top of a Christmas tree? I'm prepared to really address this topic, and we're going to. But what I want to do today is say, where did it begin? Where did all these double ideas come from? You, as well as I was, and I'm pretty sure Julian, could say, we didn't worship Jesus Christ. We worship Paul. Whatever Paul said, we were fine of it. But never did one person decide to go and find out just who is Paul? What is his origin? Where did he come from? What was he involved in? Now, all of you, I started out by saying about women in the ministry. Paul is the one who told the women to remain silent. Here's the crazy part. You see, Paul was a Roman soldier. And the Roman soldiers were devout to their God. They would not, under any circumstance, convert. And Julian, you know what their their God, their name, his name was? Mithra. Mithra. Mithra had the very same description as Jesus Christ. A number of followers being born in a a, a cave or manger, uh, divine birth by a virgin. And and I want to stop you right here because I want you to really think about this. According to the Jewish law and according to Jewish history, you could not have a child as a virgin. That child would be known as a bastard child. According to scripture, he could not enter into the temple of God. So you made an unholy act by using some spirit, and there's another name for that in in the occult. Again, I'm not going into that today. But that's the impregnation of a woman done by a spirit. 
That was not the spirit of God. So I want to clarify that. If you look very closely to Paul's writing, he tells women to remain silent. And I can see why, especially if you've got me in the pulpit, or you've got me on the, on the line. Uh, they would want to make sure that no one got the word out. And women, when they really get a message from God and really start seeking God, as well as men, if they would quit being so full of pride and arrogance, would have to face the reality of what we have been a part of. I said to you the other day, isn't it strange? I said, here I am. I'm going to bring the world the truth. And i got another thing for you. God would not give me the powerful anointing that he has given me if he was not with me. At any given point, at any given time, I can step into his presence and his power will fill the air. I say this in confidence. I didn't choose this road. God chose it. So my point is, I am told him, I will do whatever you ask of me. And we went over to Mardell's the Christian bookstore. I wanted to see just how many Christmas trees and stuff that they have up in there. And I was shocked. There wasn't. And I thought, well, at least they're better than some of these other places. You got them in your churches. You go bow down at that altar and you've got Christmas trees on your platform. Isn't that almost like Jeremiah 10? They're going to bow down to that tree when they pick that, that present up. And if we want to get to the technicality of it, I got this for you. When the wise men or the nobles came, won't get into the details of how this is an inconsistent story, but they gave the gift to Jesus. Is that not correct? And why are we giving them to each other? Because we declare that each other's gods. It's that's a that's a crazy thing. I've got to buy something for you. God does not have to be bought. He doesn't get traded. He should be first and foremost in your life. So you're getting your children all these gifts and adoring them as little deities. Mm -hmm. And they end up acting like that. The demanding situation. It's, It's really unfortunate and it's terrifying at the same time. So you want to say, oh, I don't worship the Christmas tree. You worship your children. Now I can say... I wanted to find everything as an opposite when I started researching Christmas. I did not want to give Christmas up. That was my favorite holiday. And I went into this with the open mind and said, I'm going to prove we can have Christmas. I had taken a Christmas tree out. I started putting up the nativity scene, but I was still putting presents around the nativity scene, still not knowing completely what all of this was about. You know, Muslims... Islam is against the holidays because in their text, those holidays represent paganism. And in their thought and mind, if you're participating in that, you're a pagan. Mm -hmm. You say, oh, I love God. Do you? Do you really love God? Because then tell me why it is so hard for you just to pack it up and throw it out. Because that's not what you're about. You see, we've got so much carnality in the church. People don't care enough whether they're spiritual right. or their position in God. I never walked in on this believing I'd be anyone. And I certainly did not realize the anointing that God would give me. So as I'm touching on this, not addressing it, I'm touching on this, I want to zip back to where it all began. So let's not talk about pagan versus non-pagan. My heart's right. and That's not the reason I do it. Let's go back to where the beginning is. And this was one of the things that I brought you in and talked to you in reference to about this conversation. And I said, so many people want to argue this fact. But why don't we go back and see who brought it into effect? We're going to touch on that. And then in a little bit, as we prepare for the next segment, we're going to expound a little more on it. So, Julian, where did this mentality come from? Romans. 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 And Constantine. Mm-hmm. And you see, Constantine was not a Christian. Pagan. He was pagan. Paul was pagan. That meant they honored many gods. According to the Roman ideology, they must make friends with all the gods. Right. That's why they were polytheistic. They had to be friends with them all so that one wouldn't raise up against the other. These people were wanting a I think a representation or an example that God existed. 
So they were doing everything in their power to control the masses. Keep in mind, many people during that day and time did not have the ability to read, only the aristocratic, right. those up in society. So they could tell you anything, and you would have to believe it because you had no documentation. So when we go back to Constantine, even to the Nicene Creed, it goes back a little bit further than that. Right. He had a band of men that were confidants. And we're going to bring those names up. Again, I don't know if we're going to cut it today because I know that I'm trying to keep these in a short level. I don't have any idea of where our time frame is. So we're just at 30 minutes. So should I say, cut, pick it up the next one? No, let me finish this to this word. So Constantine was a devout worshiper right. of Sol Invictus. Devout. He was pagan to the core, and the people he associated in his life were pagan, earth worship, uh, other deities. They were never, ever alle allegiance to God. But what had happened, they became extremely irate at the Jewish people because they had to discredit everything that the Jewish stood for. Now, this is just the little highlight to it. So I want you to think about this as we go to the next clip, and it's the continuation of the elephant in the room. Keep watching.